Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a survivor because I survived Hurricane Hillary, and uh, so did everybody else, with the exception of one unfortunate gentleman in Mexico who apparently got swept into a, a river, and, and obviously I mean no disrespect either to him or to anybody else that suffered some damage from this killer hurricane that we've been told was just going to come and annihilate the West Coast, which turned into one giant massive day of mild rain by Florida standards. Um, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is, is this i actually was on the scene uh your local um your local internet uh, news source here at uh, right angle was on the scene and we got this on location footage uh during the middle of the passage of hurricane uh, hillary over los angeles well this is the uh what you just saw there is the uh is the famed uh, la river known for its beauty it's essentially it's a it's a i don't know it's a 60 mile long concrete culvert and it goes all the way out to the ocean and if you fall in there you're dead because there's no way to get out of it it's you're just in a giant flume but i was actually standing there i wanted to see the water because all the mountains are channeled into this thing and i thought oh, let's see some let's see some rushing water and i'm looking at this rushing water and I go that's about what i expected and then not for the first time, but for the first time that night, it struck me that all of that water that you just saw is fresh water. Mm. And it is going out into the ocean in an area known for its absolute lack of fresh water, its perpetual drought. It can cost you hundreds of dollars to water your lawn. It's it's simply amazing to me. And and that's what I'd like to talk about today because I'm Bill Whittles, this is Steve Green and Scott Ott. And, and folks, I think that even... I think that even California or even the city of Los Angeles, as corrupt and as incompetent as they are, would be capable of constructing large concrete cubes dug into the ground to capture most, if not all, of this water. Because if you were able to do so, you would be able to not live under drought conditions because you would be able to save the water, use the water. And here's the most amazing thing. Next time November runs around, there's going to be more water. Now, Steve, uh, I, I'm I'm optimistic about these things. I'm a space age kid, and I believed in nuclear powered desalination plants oh, and yeah. all the rest of it. But it occurred to me that it's easier to filter water than it is to actually create it, and it's certainly less expensive than it is to desalinate it. So all you're really talking about are some big giant honking holes in the ground to capture that river that's there's, just there's, that in this torrent of fresh water going right past our noses so that we can then be told a week later, you know, no watering your lawn, no washing your car, keep a shower short. We're all basically, you know, about to die here. Yeah. Uh, you know, back when Democrats gave a damn, that was a long time ago now, uh, the, the first Jerry Brown was governor of California, and it was a state of about uh, 22, 23 million people, I think. Uh, he helped build the the water infrastructure, the energy infrastructure that made the California dream possible in that that inhospitable mm -hmm. basin that you that you live in, that that thing called Los Angeles, uh, and, and the rest of the state as well, um, and you still have a water and energy infrastructure suitable for a state of about twenty five to thirty million people, except you've got thirty nine or forty million people living there now. Uh, nobody gives a damn anymore to to keep up to keep the infrastructure growing to meet the needs of the population. So that thing called the California they're, dream. They're blowing up dams. Yeah, oh, I know. They're it's, destroying it, them. It, it's obscene. It's absolutely obscene. And this is no joke. I once described the California dream as being the American dream, but better because it's in California. I, it, 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 it's some of the most beautiful land scenery that anywhere in the world and it's just right there all on the west coast of the united states and i lived there for six years i i love it i miss it i had to leave because i could see the writing on the wall and well here we are 30 years later and the thing is i'm actually i'm actually kind of fascinated by floods i grew up in st louis and my grandparents had this uh, place on the gasconade river down by uh, rolla missouri in the south central part of the state and it was basically a log cabin on stilts and there must have been two miles of floodplain on the other side of the river, okay? And the Gasconade is not a big river. You probably never even heard of it. In fact, in the summer, when the when the water is low, where where their little log cabiny thing was or little cottage was, you could walk across the river without getting the top of your chest wet. Okay, this is and it and it's only a couple hundred feet across, maybe three hundred feet across. Now, not even three hundred. Um, but we would get some floods there that wouldn't just fill up the 
two miles of floodplain. This this 200 feet wide river is now two miles wide of rushing water, but it would come up the bank on our side, and it would come up higher than the elevation of the cottage. And there were there were at least two little plaques uh, uh, on on a, on a wall showing where the floodwaters were. And there were uh, one I think was probably about knee height for a, a grown person. Another one was probably about ankle height for a grown person. So you're talking about the river not just getting filling up the floodplain, but coming up the high bank on the other side, well into this cottage on on stilts. And we drove down to, to see it. This was the massive flood. It was, I think, 1981. So I'm an 11, 12-year-old kid. And our, our the neighbor cottage was not built on stilts, and we're canoeing around it. And my uncle looks down, looks down, paddling the canoe and says, Uncle Gus needs to clean his gutters. I mean, this this is how high these waters were. So I've just, I've always been fascinated by this and the idea of being able to capture it. Well, you don't need to do that in the Midwest. We got all the dang water we could ever want. But the Western states, we've got a problem. And one of the saddest stories ever, and this this is all I need to say about this, uh, are our, our ever-increasing knowledge can sometimes be tragic. In the 20s and 30s, when we were planning things like the Hoover Dam and the, the water rights between all the Western states, what scientists didn't realize at the time is we were in a ahistorically wet period. And so they, they made the water plans based on levels of rainfall and snowfall that were not typical. And starting mm-hmm. in the, the 1990s, we began reverting to the mean. And it's been getting drier and drier, much more in line with the historical rain and snowfall patterns. And if we'd have known in the 1920s and 30s what we know now, um, Bill, those systems, those reservoirs that Los Angeles needs, you might have had them decades and decades ago. Scott, I'm glad you mentioned um, uh, the, the waterworks projects in Hoover Dam because the state of Lake Mead is absolutely terrifying the the levels of lake mead which is the the water supply backed by the by the building of the hoover dam uh, has reached levels uh, that are so low that they're completely ahistoric they're finding you know cars and bodies and things and it just it's practically dry and one of the reasons it's dry is because we let it's just like any other uh banking situation or financial situation we let more water out of lake mead than comes into it and so we continue to drop those levels and a lot of that water goes to los angeles and 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 so on and so when i'm when i'm watching this stuff going by and i just had this like i said just like this shocking realization this is fresh water it's i'm not an engineer but i play one on the internet and it and it's just a waste the waste of it and and the simplicity of what we're talking about this is not some crazy nuclear powered you know desalinization plant we're beaming energy down from orbiting solar platforms you know it's just dig some freaking holes and 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 line them with concrete and and when i think about the waste of, of what I saw just in 10 minutes there, it's enough to make a grown man cry at the, it's not even incompetence in terms of government now. It's it's contempt, I think, is probably the best word for it, you know? Just contempt. I'm always reluctant to explore motivations because I found that I don't even understand my own motivations sometimes, so yeah, hazarding a guess at someone else is, is beyond my capabilities, and nevertheless, You know, there's an old proverb that says you make hay while the sun shines. Uh, It might also be argued that you store water while it's, I don't know, raining. (laughs) And there are a lot of places in the world where they do just that. If you've ever visited a... Uh, an island community or even some places in jungles that aren't in islands, you will see that a lot of people have reservoirs on top of their houses. Um, They are storing water while they can so that they have it uh, when it's in short supply. Um, When I was in Israel a number of years ago, our tour guide took us out to this, um, and it was just me and another guy, so I wasn't with a big group. It was this, my friend had hired a tour guide, and he took us out to this city, uh, a ruins of a city out in the middle of the desert that he said was built during the Byzantine era, of which I knew nothing, but I think it was roughly like 300 to 1400 AD, something like that. Um, And this city, a key feature of this city that was built all those years ago 
were reservoirs. Uh, they look like swimming pools. Um, you know, you could see them still. You could see the, the foundations of these swimming pools and cisterns that they had built because uh, not a lot of rain falls in that area. And so when it does, they want to catch it and they want to preserve it. And so they had made provision for that. One might argue that water management distinguishes civilization from primitivism. And I think that's Bingo. the that's the painful aspect of what you're seeing in California is the that the, the the crisp line between civilization and primitivism has been blurred by our failure to make adequate provisions for what should seem patently obvious to most people. Um, in any case, there's a there's a biblical prophecy that uh, that says that the deserts will bloom, and the people of Israel have done that. It's the most magnificent thing to drive around Absolutely. Israel and see the way they have captured and managed every drop of water and turned it into trees and flowers and fruit and grain and you know it's just really phenomenal to see. Uh, while we were driving around, my friend said, you know, when I was when I was back in uh, synagogue many years ago when I was a kid, um, we used to c save our pennies and send them to Israel so that they could plant trees. And he said, and we, we drove past this area where there were all these trees. And he said, those, those trees are the ones that like, we sent the money for that. You know, that's, that's why those trees are there. And they have made this an intentional part uh, David Ben Gurion, who was their leader in the early days of the official nationhood in the in the 1900s of Israel, uh, basically moved his people out into the desert in the south part of Israel because he wanted them to be able to survive anything. And so he he mm -hmm. intentionally it's like John Kennedy's quote where he says we we do these things because they are hard. And he, Ben-Gurion, wanted his people to be able to go into the harsh uh, atmosphere and environment of the desert and make it bloom, and they did. The technology exists. It's not, you're, like you said, it's not nuclear fusion. Um, it is something that they've been doing for a thousand years. We know how to do it now. We just need the will to do it. The will, the political will, and, and, and that's it. And so when you ask yourself about something this serious, like the water crisis in California, which has been ongoing ever since I've been here, and then you look at the solution being relatively simple. And by the way, when I say the solution being relatively simple, nature's doing most of the heavy lifting yeah. here. It, it doesn't rain often in California. In fact, it stops raining generally around February or March and doesn't rain again until November. It'll look another perfect day in paradise where it's air conditioned outdoors, but there is no rain during that period. But what I mean by nature doing the heavy lifting is Los Angeles is a flat area. We don't have aquifers. We don't have, we don't have anything like that, but it is surrounded by mountains and mountains are surface area. So when it rains, that water doesn't get absorbed by the mountains. And not only do the mountains capture a lot of water in terms of surface area, the mountains are also considerate enough to essentially channel all this stuff into very yeah. small little narrow areas that you can, it's like the, it's like it's collected the rain for you and put you in one spot. You mentioned uh, collecting rain water uh, that maybe this is why this annoys me so much. I grew up in Bermuda, and Bermuda is a volcanic island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. There are no wells, there are no aquifers, there's there's no rivers, there's nothing. And so every house in Bermuda has white limestone tiles on the roof to capture the rainwater. And I remember, incidentally, that my dad got a lot of really good um, uh, goodwill towards his hotel. There was a, a, a a, a drought in Bermuda and there was no water and they were talking about sending oil tankers with water and my dad's hotel was one of two places on the island that had a desalination plant he said just bring bring whatever you got down here you know you, you're, you, Bermuda's been so kind to us and so kind to our, our guests and seems like the least we could do so it's not like this it's not like this is hard and when when I see something this important with a solution that's this easy to fix I start having to ask myself, what's wrong with these people? Why can't they figure it out? And with everything else in California, the same way, the taxes, you're driving away your tax base, you know, with the homeless situation, you're closing down cities like Los Angeles and the drug situation, the crime situation. And somewhere along the line, guys, I just realized you can no longer explain this by stupidity. You just can't. There's no way to say that no one has figured this out yet. So you have to start asking yourself, why is it that California wants so many people to leave? 
I think they should take all of the California uh, po politicians, take them right up to the headwaters of the Los Angeles River, put them in a canoe, and just let them go. We'll see you when you get to Hawaii. You can go ruin that place too, you losers. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time right here on Right Angle.